right, so that brings us to our featured guest speaker for today, who is Noel George, the Executive Director of Foundation Beyond Belief. So Noel is a secular activist who grew up in Seattle, Washington, but didn't become passionate about secular activism until she moved to Houston, Texas, and was constantly asked, where do you go to church? <laughs> She has worked as a degree chemical engineer and project manager, but moved to secular activism in 2009. Since then, she has leveraged her previously learned professional skills to help multiple national secular organizations and has also traveled around the country consulting with local groups on the topics of volunteering, leadership, organizational skills, and feminism. In addition to her work at FBB, Noelle is the founder of Mothers Beyond Belief and is on the advisory board of Secular Woman. Noelle enjoys reading, writing, playing the piano, and the rare occasions when she gets a full night's sleep. <laughs> she currently lives in Houston with her young daughter. So please welcome our guest speaker today, Noelle George. in secular activism for quite a while and I do live in Houston um, but before uh, for a few years and the reason why you may not have seen me around is because I moved to South Korea with my family my husband and my uh, young daughter that he referenced in my bio and we've lived there for the past three years and we came back in uh, about November of last year so um, I, I was previously involved in the Houston secular community I, I do know some of you guys from that um, but not everybody. There are new faces here to me, um, and I'm really happy to be back in Houston. And um, because I knew that there would be new faces, um, I wanted to do a little bit more detail about my background and my bio, just so that you all can get to know me a little bit better. Um, and that way, you know, I won't have to do it individually with each of you when I meet you. So I'm taking advantage of this um, platform. Okay, so as, as Vic mentioned, I got my chemical engineering degree at the University of Washington. Um, and actually, I want to uh, talk about my conversion and deconversion from religion a little bit. Um, we never went to church growing up, and I really didn't have any idea about um, religion or church. And then when I was in about sixth or seventh grade, I had a friend who I really looked up to. She was a little bit older than me, and she said something one day about Jesus. And I was like, who's Jesus? And I thought he was her pen pal in another state or something. I have no idea. And she said, she was very shocked. And she said, you don't know Jesus. You're, you're going to go to hell. And, you know, you, this is very important. And she was very upset. And, I, I, again, I really looked up to her. And so I went home and I told my mom, you know, we, we need to know Jesus because if we don't, we're going to go to hell and so on and so forth. And, you know, this was back in the 80s. Um, and we didn't really have people like Dale McGowan giving us guidance about, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Dale McGowan, just a couple. Um, he's, he actually founded Foundation Beyond Belief and he's uh, done a, a parenting blog, a secular parenting blog, but we didn't actually have people you know, online helping us understand how to talk to our kids about lack of religion, so their response was to take us to church. Um, instead of just kind of talking about, um, you know, some people are religious, some people aren't, which is kind of what I plan to do with my daughter. Um, and so we went to Methodist Church, and for me, it was a really important aspect of my life for a while. It was about six years that I was involved in the church, and I got baptized and confirmed and everything. And um, I felt that I really needed it at the time. Um, and then as I got older, and I kind of had... One of the things that church did for me personally was that it 
gave me a community and I was kind of shy and um, didn't have a lot of friends and here were these people saying we love you no matter what you know we love you and we accept you and it was wonderful it was something that I really needed during my teenage years and then I got to be about 19 and I had found a group of friends that I really got along with and I was coming out as bisexual um, and I all of a sudden the people from the church didn't love me so much anymore and so between that and the um, just kind of coming into my own and being more confident and having a group of friends that I was very comfortable with and, and felt very strongly about I was able to look critically at religion and say do I really believe this or not and, and the answer was no um, and so getting into religion and leaving religion was a very non-traumatic experience for me uh, I just kind of nobody tried to make me say you know I did have friends who who definitely didn't accept me once I came out as bi, but um, you know, I think in general it was very non-traumatic. Un unlike other other people that I've talked to, who it can be a very traumatic experience for because of being trying to be forced to stay or so on and so forth. So, um, so that's kind of my history with religion. Um, as we were in South Korea, I I think I was proselytized to more on the street than I ever was in Houston, which was shocking to me. Um, and so, uh, so, and I also went to a Bible study group, and there, that's a whole different story. I won't get into that, but um, if you ever want to ask me about that, because I'll be around now that we're back in Houston, um, you're welcome to. Um, so, you know, after I came to religion and then came out of religion again, I went to school for chemical engineering. I came down to Houston after college to work for a large energy company, <coughs> Chevron. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I was a project a field engineer and a project manager for Chevron and you know as you all are probably familiar with Chevron they have world-class training um, for their engineers that um, teaches us how to manage projects and, and manage budgets and things like that so um, and it was about uh, it was having people ask me about uh, where did I go to church and like it said in my bio and um, you know, some experiences that I had working at Chevron that got me really passionate about wanting to find my people. And so I went to, um, I, I started going to uh, different things. I went to a Democratic meetup, didn't really have, felt like I found my people there. And then I went to, I, I think it was a um, Houston Atheist meetup. Um, yeah, it was a Houston Atheist meetup. And, um, and, before I went, I, I had this idea. Um, I wanted to start an organization where secular people could volunteer together and um, where, where we weren't proselytizing to anyone, but we could be together as a community and volunteer because there was really nothing like that out there at the time. This was in 2008 or so. And so, um, so I, I went to this group and I met Ariel and some other people and, um, and Ariel told me the story that I sat next to him and said, I want to start a secular volunteering group. Um, and there are actually some people here today, I, I, I can't, there you are, that, that helped me start this um, secular volunteering group called the Secular Center that was founded in 2009. Um, and we actually, I hate to rain on your parade of being the first um, pride float, but we actually did a pride float way back in maybe 2010 um, with a space theme. And um, it was really fun, but it, you're right, it's very expensive. Um, so, but, uh, you know, that was through the Secular Center and also through the Houston Coalition of Reason that we did that. Um, I've also um, been the ambassador director for Atheist Alliance International, which is where I traveled around to the different groups um, in, in the country and kind of advised them on organizational things. Um, the Secular Center lasted for a couple of years and it was great. We did a lot of volunteer projects in Houston. Um, but then I had a baby and that always complicates things. <coughs> and so um, I, I felt that I, I didn't want to um, be the sole you know, uh, leader of a organization. And so I had started talking to Dale McGowan, who is the founder of Foundation Beyond Belief, about merging the two organizations. And so that's exactly what we did. We merged the Secular Center into Foundation Beyond Belief, and I started working at Foundation Beyond Belief in 2011 on the Volunteers Beyond Belief program. 
Um, and so I've held different roles at Foundation Beyond Belief since then. I've been um, the operations manager, I've been the director of special projects, and as you know, now I'm the executive director. So um, the other thing that I could talk about a little bit today, and what I'd like to do is I'm going to, uh, you know, not that you'd be able to tell through this long introduction, but I'm actually going to give kind of a short presentation. And then I would like to take questions about the areas that you guys are interested in. So if you're interested in Foundation Beyond Belief, you can ask questions about Foundation Beyond Belief. If you're interested in Mothers Beyond Belief, we can talk about that. Um, we can talk about Secular Women. We can talk about Secular Avenue. I'd like to let you lead the conversation a little bit about what we talk about. So, um, so I'll actually be going through this, you know, quite, I'm not going to give a 45 or 50 minute presentation here. Um, so I will just briefly say that I founded Mothers Beyond Belief, which is a, um, it's got over 3,000 members now. It's a group online that, for secular mothers, anyone who identifies as a mother is welcome to join. So it's trans friendly. Um, and we did the, that on purpose in the beginning. We wanted a group that was going to be trans friendly. Um, and then uh, I, I got asked to join the advisory board of Secular Women a few years ago, which is a group that um, serves to amplify the voices of women in secularism, um, just kind of promote women's work and make sure that our, our voices are being heard and that our needs are being met in the secular community. Um, and then Secular Avenue, which is what I'm going to talk about next. So, uh, um, Secular Avenue is an organization that I founded last year. Um, it is an organization serving individuals, and the first program that we created is called the SAFE program, Secular Avenue for Exit SAFE. Um, it helps create and enhance the path to safety for people who are leaving religion and are unsafe at home, for people who are coming out as LGBTQ, or for people who are experiencing domestic violence. And domestic violence is actually um, quite a community, it's a community that is very well served already in certain areas. Um, we have the Houston Women's Center, uh, Houston Area Women's Center, I think is the official name. Um, here in Houston, but those locations get filled up. Um, sometimes it, there are, it's, it's kind of like homelessness. There's a, pre, um, a predilection toward proselytizing in these types of areas. Um, a lot of organizations form and then they require um, certain, you know, activities, prayers, or things like that for people, um, or they try to convert them. And so, um, what we've done is we've taken best practices from domestic violence advocacy and outreach and applied it to uh, other, other areas that are not as well served, like leaving religion. There's no organizations out there that help people who are unsafe because they're leaving religion. Um, and so that's what um, one of the things that Secular Avenue does. Has anyone heard of Secular Avenue before this? Two, three, okay. So. Um, so that's what Secular Avenue does. We offer free uh, therapy services. We offer um, financial assistance. Um, we offer uh, logistical assistance, um, such as you know helping someone find a if they have a domestic violence uh, facility in their area and they're eligible for that. We can help them kind of take the you know take the lead to get help from that organization. So um, there are various ways that we can do logistical assistance and then legal assistance. We have a network of lawyers that we can consult with. Like for example, coming out as LGBTQ, um, you know, someone who is unsafe, maybe someone who's underage, and they're coming out and they're unsafe because their parents um, are, are giving them a hard time about that or not believing that that's an okay thing. And so, um, so we need to consult with lawyers because of emancipation laws and things like that. So, um, so that's those are the services that we provide. Um, so, and I'd be happy to, you know, again take questions about Secular Avenue later. Um, but that's that's Secular Avenue. Seems really sensitive. Um, so now I'm going to talk about Foundation Beyond Belief, which is. The thing that I like to talk about the most. So this is going to be uh, this is going to be 
a little a little while, but um, how, who, who had heard of Foundation Beyond Belief before this presentation? Wow, a lot, a lot, that's great. Um, who here are members of Foundation Beyond Belief? A fair amount, okay, thank you. At the 2011 Free John Convention that was here in Houston, Dale McGowan spoke about it. Ah, okay, good. Um, is anyone a Foundation Beyond Belief founding 50 or 100 member? No, okay. Um, okay, well, uh, thank you to those of you who are members. We really appreciate um, your contributions. And um, I, so, now that I know who is familiar and who's not, then we, I can tailor my presentation a little bit toward that. Um, last year, Foundation Beyond Belief, we did a strategic plan and we revised our mission statement. And our new um, mission is to unite the humanist community in charitable efforts and advocate for compassionate action throughout the world. We believe that by working together, we can make a significant, measurable, and positive impact on the world. Um, that means that if somebody gives $20 to a cause, somebody else gives $10, somebody gives $50, that's three different causes that get three different contributions that are important. Um, but if those three people combine their, their funds to one cause, then that's $80 going to one cause and it makes a, it makes a greater impact. Um, likewise, if, if a group is volunteering and 10 volunteers come out versus uh, another group where five volunteers come out, versus another group, you know, that's an impact, but it makes a greater impact when more people come out for the same cause. So we just try to coordinate um, what, what we're doing, and you guys are already volunteering, um, you're doing wonderful things, and you were doing that even before I left for, uh, for South Korea, and I remember that. Um, so, uh, so I know that I don't have to convince your group that volunteering is important, which is a lot of times what I usually do on this slide. Um, but Foundation Beyond Belief's vision is humanists as global, global leaders in philanthropy. And what that means is that we're setting the trends. We are following the evidence, um, we are doing the best practices, and we are communicating what we're doing so that we're not only making a difference, but we are out ahead of the pack. Um, and that's what we hope for the humanist community uh, in, in terms of volunteering and philanthropy. So, um, so yeah, that's that's why I believe that FPB is important. Um, Humanists of Houston at the Houston Food Bank. Um, this is from one of your reports last year, and I just I like to throw in um, pictures of the local group doing doing what they do if they do anything um, because it's it's <coughs> cool to be recognized for what you're doing and. Um, I know you guys submitted several reports last year, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why it's important to, su to um, submit those reports, um, because you can get money from us for it, so that's always good. So in order to become leaders in global ph philanthropy, in order to make a difference throughout the world, we have four programs um, at Foundation Beyond Belief. One is, some of you are already familiar with becoming a member. What that entails is that you give a donation monthly, and that donation goes toward a slate of five, five, usually five beneficiaries that we pick each quarter. Now, you may be thinking at this point, uh-oh, they take money and then they give it away, but how much do they give away? How much do they keep for themselves? Does anyone know? Does anyone want to shout out? 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah, we don't keep any of the money that our members donate to our beneficiaries. Um, we even cover the PayPal costs that it costs people to give that money because we believe that, we believe so strongly that by working together and giving our contributions, we can make a huge difference. And so that, for that reason, we don't take a cut out of what you give. Um, we're not a, you know, pass through. Um, a typical pastor organization. Um, we sometimes choose one beneficiary a month or for a quarter and the reason for that is because evidence shows that as I said before the more money that you give to one organization the greater difference that you can make. So we are we like to feature five beneficiaries sometimes because it gives you an idea of the different organizations that um, 
that are in each category. It kind of shakes things up. It lets people become familiar with different things. Um, but two times so far, we've given all the money in a quarter up to $50,000 is how much our grants are to one organization um, to, to that specific organization. And I'll talk about that in a little bit if, if anyone is interested. Um, so that's our Humanist Giving program. Um, the, the next program that I want to talk about is the Beyond Belief program. And I'll, I'll talk about that briefly because I'm going to get into a little bit more detail. The Beyond Belief program is where groups like yours, local groups, join and they do volunteer events and they get stuff from us for doing volunteer events. They get grants, they get uh, awards, um, and all you have to do is submit your events. So I went in the system and looked and I don't think you guys have submitted an event since October and I know you're doing stuff. I so know it's my fault. It's your fault. I'm okay. so bad. So I'm not going to do it tonight. <laughs> Submit your events because you, um, the more events that you submit in a, um, in a year, the more cool stuff that you get. So uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the other thing that you could do uh, as part of the, as one of our programs is to register for Humanist Disaster Recovery Teams as a, as a potential volunteer. This is a newer program that we have. When, we, when Foundation Beyond Belief started, in 2010, quarter one was our first um, our first giving year. We were giving about $1,500 per beneficiary. Now we give about $10,000 per beneficiary, so we've grown quite a bit, um, thanks to some of you in the audience. And um, and then we added the Beyond Belief Network, which was what I mentioned earlier. Secular Center rolled into Foundation Beyond Belief and created Volunteers Beyond Belief, and we rebranded that to Beyond Belief Network. Um, so that's been around since about 2011. Um, Humanist Disaster Recovery Teams is, has been in the works for several years. Did, who knows Rebecca Vitzman? Some. She, and maybe more will raise my hands after I tell you, raise your hands after I tell you who she is. She is a woman that uh, her, her house was destroyed in the to tornado in Moore, Oklahoma. And she was on CNN with Wolf Blitzer, and he really pushed her to say that you gotta thank God, you gotta thank God that you were saved. Yeah, do you know, okay, who knows who she is now? Yeah, a lot more people, okay. So I'll switch that part around in my speech going forward. Um, so she had this vision as she was being proselytized to by people as, her, as she was picking through the pieces of her home. Um, she was, uh, laying out tattered, you know, lead covered um, and contaminated pieces of clothing in her yard and wanting to take pictures of them because she had this uh, idea when she was 90 years old, she would have a quilt of her, of her baby's clothing that she put together and she would be able to remember these different times in, in her baby's life. And her son is about the same age as my daughter and they, they're friends. Um, but, um, she, uh, she wanted to have this memento, and she was grieving the loss of not being able to have this memento. And one of the women asked her, who was a volunteer there, asked her, um, you know, what church do you go to? That's the, the innocuous first question, isn't it? It's, it's so innocent sounding, but it leads to such uh, difficult things. Um, she said, what church do you go to? And she said, you know, we don't really go to church. She kind of tried to deflect, Rebecca did. And the woman proceeded to give her a 30-minute lecture on, you know, well, you're raising this baby without Jesus? And, you know, the woman was horrified. And, you know, Rebecca, in her grief that she was trying to process all these emotions, you know, was then subjected to, during this vulnerable time, additional trauma. And so, um, so she and I got together. Um, this is when I was director of special projects, and we started um, with another FPB staff member crafting this program, um, the Disaster Recovery Teams program. We already Foundation Beyond Belief already raises funds for a, a drive, um, a, a disaster. Just collects funds to give to a disaster in case of um, one we did in Nepal last year. Um, We've done other various disasters, but we didn't actually have volunteers on the ground. 
And so that's what this is. This is um, signing up as a volunteer to help rebuild in the event of a disaster. And um, we actually sent our first team, it was our pilot team, to Columbia, South Carolina in January to rebuild from the floods there. And I got to go for a day. Um, and it was really, um, it was really important to be there. I actually had, we actually, while I was there, had someone um, come up who was part of a, a quilt making charity. They make quilts for the survivors of a disaster and then they make these little quilt squares, they're about this big, um, and they give them to the volunteers. And so, she, you know, I was um, the executive director, so she came up to me first, even though I wasn't really in charge, and um, she said, uh, you know, we'd like to give you these quilts and thank you for what you're doing um, and we're praying for you and, you know, so on and so forth that she gave me this little card with a Bible verse and, you know, kind of went on about how they were praying for us and how they thought what we were doing was wonderful, which was great, um, except for the praying part. And so um, at first I was kind of like, oh, I was shocked, you know, and I, I my first reaction was, no, I don't want that. You know, um, I don't want to be proselytized to while I'm trying to help someone. And then, and I said, you know, actually we're, we're all secular here. The, this group is secular um, because it was a Foundation Beyond Belief team and everyone there was secular. And she said, oh, thank you so much for telling me. We would never want to push our religion on anyone. I'm so glad you said something. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, I expected something else. And, um, and I had to adapt very quickly and I said, you know what, I will take it. Thank you, you know, for coming around. It's great that you're doing this. Um, because they weren't, you know, she, she adapted, so I adapted. And the next person that she went to, which happened to be Rebecca, um, who was there the whole week and did a phenomenal job of, um, of putting the, the logistics together for this, um, and she dropped the prayer part. And she just said, you know, we're thinking of you. We think it's wonderful what you're doing. Um, we want to encourage you. And I found out that they go typically a few months after a disaster when people's morales are at the lowest and just try to encourage people. And I thought, you know what? They, maybe from now on, because we were there and because we said we were secular, maybe they'll ask first. You know, maybe they won't. But we were there, and you know, we proved in that moment that not everyone who volunteers is secular, and you shouldn't assume that um, that you know people are religious because they're doing good. And um, I didn't get to meet the homeowner, but Rebecca and some of the others did. And I'm really sad that I didn't get to meet her because you know she's she and her family were the reason why we were there. We weren't there to prove that we're secular or humanist or whatever. But it, you know, I wanted to tell that story because it's an interesting byproduct of being out there and being in the community. And, and I think it's really important. So, um, so that's what Disaster Recovery Teams is. Um, and then Humanist Service Corps is a, uh, the former Pathfinders Project. Have you guys heard of that? Connor Robinson in Ghana. Anyone heard of that? Okay, no. Um, couple. Uh, okay, so we have a team of volunteers in Ghana who are um, working in one of five witch camps in Ghana. I know you didn't think that witch camps were a thing, right? They're a thing. Um, in Ghana, witchcraft is still a very uh, a superstitious belief that they have, and they usually target women who are older kind of more successful in their community and if they don't have a man to speak for them um, then if something bad happens they'll say well this woman you know sh she's getting a lot of success it's kind of a it's not a um, conscious thought process per se but it's a pattern that happens and they'll say well it must be her because you know she's doing well and uh, if she doesn't have a man to speak for her uh, because it's a very patriarchal society then she'll um, end up going to the witch camps, and it's voluntary rehabilitation. Um, so they go, and they're supposed to be rehabilitated in the witch camps, but a lot of times they, um, the communities will refuse to have them back. Um, they'll say the rehabilitation didn't work, 
and um, and then they'll just be there. And, and a lot of times their kids and the grandkids may have to go with them. So um, so the Humanist Service Corps, it's it's kind of like the Peace Corps, but it's different. Um, we work to make sure that our practices are sustainable, that we're not having a negative impact on the community. Um, we work really hard to elevate the voices that are already there and not um, communicate in our own voices. And um, you know, we just want to uh, lend our skills without taking over because that's a really important thing um, in a community that, um, that needs help. You have to listen to what they're saying they need help with. And then you help. You don't take over and um, just kind of say, well, this is what you should do or whatever. You just um, support and elevate the voices. So that's what we're doing in Ghana. Um, I wanted to kind of run through the um, giving beneficiaries just to kind of give you an idea of what we feature. Um, Square One Villages is our current human rights beneficiary. And um, you can read it up there, but I'll just say that they transition the unhoused to more permanent housing solutions, and they work out of Eugene, Oregon. Um, they build little tiny houses. They're so cool. Um, Deadly Street Neighborhood Initiative. Now, this was our first Compassionate Impact Grant, the very large grants that we give. Um, this is a, a community in Boston, Massachusetts, that, where they have organized and empowered the local community to build a coalition um, to improve housing and eliminate illegal dumping and things like that. Um, Starfish is ed our education, and they were our first, um, they were our second big grant. Um, and if you're noticing a trend, I will tell you about it at the end. Um, Starfish uh, provides education and student support for girls within the Native Mayan community in Guatemala. Um, they do uh, um, mentoring and things like that for the girls and there the girls are I think sixth grade and older are sixth grade and older um, Lighthawk is our natural world beneficiary um, these are the five categories that we always have in our in our humanist giving program unless we're doing one big grant um, and they connect researchers and scientists with small plane pilots to uh, allow for monitoring and research in natural areas and they do that all over um, so I didn't put a location there and then Buddhist Global Relief. Now this is a special category. Um, it's called Challenge the Gap. And if you notice the Buddhist thing, you might be thinking, Buddhist? That doesn't sound secular. I thought you guys were secular. Um, Challenge the Gap is a, a special category where we take a religiously identified but not proselytizing organization. And we, we give them a grant to further their work and they have to be doing work for the community good. They can't be Buddhists helping only Buddhists or Christians helping only Christians or Muslims helping only Muslims. Um, they have to be uh, non-proselytizing and working for the greater good. Um, now, I, I also want to say you may be thinking at this point, well, I don't want my money to go there. I mean, it sounds okay, but I don't want my money to go there. The cool thing about Foundation Beyond Belief is that you can give your money and then you can say where you want it to go. So you can say you want $5 to go to each one if you have a $25 donation. You can put your $25 just to one beneficiary. You can put, you know, you can split them between the four secular ones and not give to Challenge the Gap. You can give it all to Challenge the Gap if you like that idea. Everyone has the ability to customize their donations in the way that they want. And you don't ever have to give money to an organization that you don't like. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that we vet all of these organizations very closely, especially Challenge the Gap. We vet Challenge the Gap more than we vet the other organizations because we want it, we have to make sure that they're not proselytizing. The funny thing about religious organizations is usually if they're proselytizing, they like to shout it from the rooftops. So it's pretty easy to tell a lot of times when they're when they're proselytizing. But um, this quarter is a special quarter. Um, because of the evidence-based practices that it's good to um, give more money to specific organizations, we've chosen to re-feature um, two of our previous really big grant beneficiaries um, because there's a lot of reasons that it helps them. But one is that they can rely on support from us. 
in this quarter and we're going to be doing it again in quarter one 2017 so you'll see these same two beneficiaries here um, it helps them not have to do fundraising it helps uh, it helps them not have to um, worry about where their money is coming from and it just provides a little cushion of support for them um, that evidence-based practices have shown is um, is really important so um, so that's what I wanted to say about our beneficiaries. Um, I'll scroll real quick to, I just wanted to show you one other quarter so that you could see the variety um, of, of the types of beneficiaries that we feature in each of the categories. So like um, in Challenge the Gap World, faith uh, reduces violence um, by using interfaith volunteers. So that was a kind of interfaith effort. Um, all of our beneficiaries, we vet for financial um, uh, competency. We vet them for being secular, except for our Challenge the Gap, which we vet for not proselytizing. Um, we vet them for uh, evidence-based practices. We make sure that they, what they're doing gets results. So that's another example. Um, I'm just going to talk to you briefly about Beyond Belief Network. Um, you guys are a Beyond Belief Network team, and that's very exciting for me. Um, there are two ways that you can um, have events that qualify as part of Beyond Belief Network. One is a foundation partner program event. Um, you can sign up five members to FBB's Humanist Giving Program. So if five people today decide that they like what I've talked about and they want to be a member, they can do it through HOH and you get credit for an event. Um, or you can do a fundraising event um, where at least 50% of the proceeds go to FBB or one of our current beneficiaries. So if you like one of the beneficiaries um, that I've talked about or um, you want to maybe um, next quarter we're going to do one of our big grants and we haven't decided who that's going to be yet but um, I know the final four choices and they're all very exciting, um, doing great work, um, then you can get credit that way. Um, a Volunteers Beyond Belief event is doing service activities like your event yesterday at the Houston Food Bank um, or uh, any other type of activities, your walk um, for the, the Run Against Violence will count, um, or fundraisers for non-FBB beneficiaries. Let's say you have a local Houston um, group that you really like um, and you want to raise funds for them, that would also count as a, as a Volunteers Beyond Belief event. Oh, I just wanted to throw another picture in of you guys. Um, at the food bank because you're so, you're so awesome. So, um, okay, so events like that count. Um, all you have to do is submit them. Um, and these are the levels. So the more, I'm sorry. You can Just beat back. me over the head with the clock, okay? <laughs> Just submit your events and I won't have to. <laughs> um, no. Uh, so there are different levels that you can, um, you can reach by doing the events, um, and you can see them up here and what you get by them. Level one is for uh, VBB events or two of the top ones that I talked about, the foundation partner program events, and you get eight free t-shirts, and you get the option to put your group logo on the t-shirts, so it'll say like Foundation Beyond Belief on the front, and then your group logo could be on the back, so that's pretty cool, um, and eligible for a team of the month, and I, I didn't put it on here, but also picture of the month. Um, Level two is eight events or four foundation partner program events, and um, that gives you eligibility for our annual awards. Um, those have monetary prizes, um, eligibility for a service project grant up to two hundred fifty dollars. So just we free money, free money, um, and then priority and promotion and vetting requests. Um, level three is twelve events of either type, which gives you twelve more free T-shirts. Um, and the eligibility for a grant up to $500. So, you know, just so you know, every time that you guys are participating in those service events for HOH, you're helping HOH to get money. You're helping HOH to get um, visibility. Um, and, I mean, and also you're getting to do an awesome thing for your community. So, um, that's really, that's always really rewarding. Um, student, I just wanted to put a note in case there are any students here. Um, student teams only have to meet 75% of the requirements because their um, school year is shorter than the annual year, than the regular year. So, um, 
And that's, that's it. Um, I, I already asked about the Foundation 50 supporters and the members, but um, team leaders, you guys, you guys are team leaders, you don't want to stand up, that's fine. I've given you a hard time through this whole thing, so I understand. Um, and who here, maybe you can just raise your hand, who's um, a member who's participated in the volunteer events before for, through HOH? Cool. Okay. Well, um, other than that, I mean, do you guys have any questions? I know I've covered a lot, but yes. Um. All right, yeah, thank you very much, Noel. Yeah, we've got plenty of time here for a QA. and um, We probably need to just shut things down at about uh, 45 after in order to uh, have time to clean up. Um, oh, and thanks for setting the record straight on the pride, the pride float. I didn't know, I was not aware of that, so that's, uh, it's cool that y'all did that, though. Um, yeah, that, it yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that was before I got my start with uh, you know my activism. In, uh, um, so yeah, I was not aware of it. But that's very cool. Um, so yeah, we. Uh, so please. Uh, so yeah, I'll set up the mic. I'll move that microphone over here. So if y'all, anybody wants to uh, ask questions, uh, go ahead and just line up uh, in the middle here. And um, please keep your questions uh, concise and to the point. Please just uh, please do. Ask questions. Don't just uh, come up to, to make statements and, and whatnot. So, um, oh, and actually, if I could just get things kicked off while I set uh, up the mic, uh, I didn't mention earlier, but the uh, this is Noelle's second time actually to come speak to uh, HOH. Um, it was about four years ago that uh, she came and uh, gave a talk, and um, I remember one of the things you talked about was uh, the, the differences statistically in terms of uh, charity giving between the religious and the non-religious. Um, could you maybe touch on that a little bit, and maybe uh, have, you know, has have those numbers changed uh, in the last in the last four years? Okay. Yeah. Um, can you all still hear me? Okay. Yes. All right. Good. Um, well, the I haven't looked at recent research between the religious and non-religious, but before when I presented, um, the religious actually give more. Is that feedback? The religious actually give more money and more often. But the research has shown that the reason why they do that is because they have a venue for giving regularly. So when, you know, if somebody came to you every week and they said, hey, give money, give money. Can you give money today, you know? And they gave you a great talk and they passed around the plate, you know, would you give money? <laughs> Probably. Um, but, you know, we don't really have that. Um, as, you know, the non-religious. And so when Dale founded Foundation Beyond Belief, he wanted to provide an avenue for non-believers to give, and that's why we have the monthly giving program. It's easy. It, you don't have to think about it. You know that, you know, your, chari that your uh, contributions are going to research charities, and it just increases giving. And when you have that avenue for giving, um, it, uh, it increases giving. So. Um, I do believe the religious also count like, you know, um, uh, what am I trying to think of? Uh, mission trips and things like that is, as, um, as giving. So I, I wouldn't really count that personally, but you know, that's what part of what they count in their giving. So, um, so hopefully that answers the next question. I speak rather loudly. And yeah, I'll repeat your question. Uh, my first question is, do you always use the term secular rather than non-believers? Because I can imagine there would be areas in our country that don't know the definition of secular. So do you make a conscious decision always to use secular? That's my first question. Okay, do I make a conscious decision always to use secular? Um, rather than non-believers. Rather than non-believers. obvious. Right. Um, no, I think uh, I think for me, secular is just kind of an easier term than non-believer. I think it's just kind of a term that I uh, that I started using um, early on with the secular center, and it just kind of comes out now. So I probably say secular when I mean non-believer, um, but that's a good point that people in some areas might not know, you know, the word secular. So. It, it sounds to me as if it's avoiding anything that's confrontational 
are that might be objectionable to someone. Hmm. Anyway. I mean, I, I wouldn't try to do that in a group like this. I think I'm just so used to it because of the secular center and the secular avenue that it just comes out that way. My second question is, when you had the slide up that said a safe exit from violence when you're leaving religion, are there actually incidents of violence against people who are leaving their religious denomination? Right. If so, give me a couple of examples. Okay, the question is, are there actually examples of violence when people leave religion? Absolutely. Um, a lot of the applicants, I can't talk about specific applicants because of confidentiality laws, but um, I can say that applicants um, might not necessarily be in the U.S. Um, Middle Eastern areas and things like that um, have issues of violence when, um, when someone comes out, Africa, you know, other places around the world. But um, I could say, I think generally enough that we get a lot of applicants from India and the Middle East. So. But not in the U.S. Uh, we haven't had an instance in the U.S., no, but I, there are stories sometimes about, um, again, uh, teenagers who have really extremist parents and they may come out as atheists. I've, I've read stories um, about that, so that is a possibility, although we haven't had any applicants in that case. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say congratulations for all the work you do because it seems overwhelmingly a lot. <laughs> and, and, but then I was wondering about the same thing because you mentioned so many institutions there that we don't know, I don't know where to start from. You know, like how do people choose or just we're saying also that it's better to channel it into less, so why so many? Right. I mean, I think the best place to start is with your local group. Um, participating in the activities that your local group is doing and the fundraisers that your local group is doing. And I would say that if you want to, in addition to that, start at a national level, then I would recommend um, either becoming a member, and you can become a member of Foundation Gambling for as little as $5 a month, um, so it's very affordable. Or you can um, sign up for like the disaster recovery team if there was ever a disaster in this area. Um, and it's no obligation to sign up for the team. Like you could sign up and say, I could potentially be available if in the Houston area or in the Texas area. And then let's say something happens and we contact you. You know, there's no obligation. So you can say, sorry, I can't do it this time. But it, then at least we'll be able to draw upon you if, if that was something that you're interested in. So, um, you know, it's always. People give what they can when they can, and I'm a huge advocate of that because I give a lot of my time and energy to to giving. And um, you know, I could completely overwhelm myself with all the great causes out there, but I have to just focus on the areas that I feel most passionate about and know that I'm doing what I can when I can. So, thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. When you are choosing the beneficiaries to which you donate. Uh, do you have specific requirements about the percentage of funds that they give directly to the cause versus for advertising and things like that? Right. Um, there is actually a thing called the overhead myth. I don't know, has anyone heard of the overhead myth? Um, some of you have. Um, that, uh, you know, charities should spend at least X amount on overhead versus on programs. And, excuse me, and that, um, that is something that people in nonprofit work are trying to raise awareness of. Um, we used to look at that, um, but as the further research had come out about the overhead myth, um, we stopped placing so high of a value on that. Now we wouldn't fund a charity that you know that was an extreme of that. Like we wouldn't fund a charity that um, spent 10% on programs and 90% on overhead. But you have to look at the specific charity too. Like some charities. Um, Foundation Beyond Belief is one example early on. We didn't have any direct service programs. We only had Volunteers Beyond Belief and the Humanist Giving Program. And those were very staff heavy programs. So our overhead was higher. Now our, our overhead is lower because we have direct service programs. So, you know, you can't look at a charity and say, well, they're spending 70, only 75% of 
their funds on programs, so we're not going to consider them. But you know, you have to look at each charity individually and kind of decide in that case. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay. My question kind of ties into that with Foundation Beyond Belief. I mean, you're donating 100 percent. How do you make money, and what's your budget? And compare. Give me a like. Where are you compared to say? United Way or <laughs> Salvation Army or I mean yeah. where does Foundation Beyond Belief fit in that hierarchy of things? Right. Okay. Um, we our budget um, in 2013 our total revenue was um, about seven hundred thousand um, dollars. In 2014 it was less than five hundred thousand. I think we got a big grant. That was before I was in charge of the money stuff. But um, I think we got a big grant in 2013 that made it a lot higher. Um, but um, our, our budget is around four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars, and that includes the money that we give away to the beneficiaries. So you know, if you just think about that, we give fifty thousand dollars away per quarter. That's half our budget, at least, that we're giving away. And then another big chunk of that is we're we're passing it through to the beneficiaries. And, and another big chunk of that is to direct service. So I would say that our, um, you know, our overhead is, is actually pretty low, and given the fact that all of our staff are part-time, like I'm part-time, I work 10 hours a week this year. Um, and so, um, so we're pretty small comparatively. Where does your salary come from? Oh, well, we, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't answer that part of the question. Um, the Foundation 50 supporters that we have, those are people that give directly to the foundation. Um, and so we, we make about, you know, five to seven thousand dollars a quarter on people that give directly to support the foundation's operational costs. Sometimes we'll get a, a, um, a, a larger donor who will give us ten thousand dollars or so on and so forth. And we also do a year-end <laughs> fundraising drive where we crowdfund for our operational costs. We only do that once a year. Um, we might have to do it twice this year because our, it wasn't a very good fundraising year for a lot of secular organizations last year. Um, but my policy is that I only want to crowdfund for our operational costs once a year if I can at all help it. So, um, so hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hi. My question's about my question's about the secular avenue. I wondered if you are are you at the point with that program where you're trying to partner with any other local groups that help with you know domestic violence programs or related programs, or do you advertise yourself solely online and just try to reach out that way? How are you advertising that and connecting with communities? Right. Okay. So how are we advertising Secular Avenue um, to those in need? We mostly do it online. Um, we haven't really, I can't really see a case where a local domestic violence group would want us to help them, oops, excuse me, us to help them because um, their programs are very well fleshed out and specific for that community. Um, but there has been times when someone has applied to a local organization and then found out about Secular Avenue on their own and applied as well. And what we try to do is we try to fill in the gaps if there are any of the local organizations. So if they're providing you know, housing assistance, but maybe the person needs um, a cell phone and that local group doesn't have a cell phone program, we might provide a cell phone or something like that. So we definitely work very closely when the person is eligible for a local assistance to make sure that we're not duplicating. So thank you. What skills do you need to volunteer for disaster relief? Well, I'm not really a you know very That's strong. A question. Oh, what skills do you need to volunteer for the disaster relief? I mean, um, I I'm not really a you know hand work with your hands kind of person, I guess. And I was able to go and do um, mudding and taping and things like that. So you don't really. Uh, what we try to do is we try to match the skills of the person with the task. Um, so when we were in South Carolina, there was someone that maybe couldn't do, you know, reaching with their arms and doing the type of mudding or painting or whatever physical work that, um, that they wanted, but they brought lunch a couple days, and that was their contribution. So I would say, 
um, no skills are required, that anyone can help. Um, we've had people uh, who work at restaurants offer, you know, food. Um, we've had people that, you know, just want to help online, offer help with promotion, you know, offer help with logistics and organizing, that kind of thing. You can donate directly to teams if you have a lot of money and you want to give us money. We always like that. Um, you know, there's there's tons of different ways that you can help and we try to match people with, with their skills. So. Um, my question kind of ties into that. Do you have someone that organized specifically on-ground medical providers? Like, I'm a medic, and I know a lot of paramedics and pre-hospital workers and nurses that are atheist or secular and would be interested in providing health care in the event of disaster. Right. Um, there are two phases of a disaster. There is the relief phase and the recovery phase. Um, when a disaster happens, um, immediately after when, you know, you hear a lot on the news about it, um, you hear that people are being rescued um, from places and things like that, that's the relief phase. And that is a shorter phase that happens right after a disaster. And then there's a longer phase that happens for a long time. You know, the, the flooding happened, you know, now in 2014, I think it was, in South Carolina. And we were there in January of 2016. And the reason that we, um, the reason that we work in recovery instead of relief is because there's a greater need in recovery. What happened in the situation in South Carolina is that, you know, you do the relief and <laughs> and um, people get rescued and then they start to rebuild and FEMA comes in and all the organizations come in to help. And what's left after all those organizations are done helping whoever they're going to help, insurance comes in and does their thing, is the people that fall through the cracks. And that is one of the people that we were helping in January, is someone that wasn't, didn't have insurance, you know, couldn't get a FEMA application to go through, you know, whatever else. And she was, she lived right there on the river, like, you could walk from, you know, 50 feet from her house to the river. You could see it out the, out the yard. I should really put one of those pictures in my presentation because it's quite stunning. Um, and, you know, she didn't have anyone to help her um, except for the, the group that we partnered with um, to go and do, do that recovery. And so there's less of a need for, I'm getting to your question now finally, Amanda, there's less of a need for medical services in that type of environment. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, rule it out and I wouldn't say that we would always go so late. There might be a time when we would go earlier, so anyone who is, you know, medically trained would, could be useful. Um, we actually did have somebody um, step on a nail in January, and so, you know, having someone with medical training there, I mean, she's fine. Um, she, she got uh, treatment right away, but, um, you know, I think having someone there with medical training is a huge asset, so. Anybody else? Is that it? You guys are, yeah? Do you have a partner with religious groups? Um, I mean, besides the challenge of the gap, um, it's not something that, um, that I, I would say that we've done personally, like FBB, but sometimes our Beyond Belief Network teams do interfaith events. Sometimes they do um, religious, you know, partner with religious groups. Like, I believe the Harvard Humanists um, partnered with uh, interfaith groups around their city to do a meal packing event. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't say that FBB has done that directly. Um, and it, it wouldn't be something that I would be opposed to, per se, if the conditions were right. Um, the conditions would have to be right, no proselytizing. Um, and, you know, and I would have to think about it. And probably, we'd probably survey our members because we like to do that, so. She said, do you ever partner with religious groups? I forgot to repeat the question. I thought there was one more question. Was there one more question? Are you guys done with me now? Oh, one more question.
have you given any further thought, and I'm going to direct this to the audience, everybody who eats at a restaurant at least once a week. Anybody here? Raise your hands. How many of you eat at least once a week? Okay. For the last six years, I have been setting aside a dollar each time I eat at a restaurant. Okay. I remember. That's right. You've been pushing this program for a long time. That's right. Six, six years. Uh, Since I first met you. Okay. Uh, thus far, I have given the Houston Food Bank, which is a secular organization, by the way, I have given them over $600. We've wow. eat out a lot over six years. Okay. So, folks, for whatever it's worth, this is a challenge. Right. He's, oh, repeat the, I'll, I'll repeat it. He's issuing everyone a challenge. Every time you eat at a restaurant or once a week, you give like a dollar. Um, you set aside a dollar to a pot, and then you give that money to a secular organization. Yep. He calls it the restaurant mini tithe. <laughs> All right.